Thank you for considering the Corporate Cowboys podcast. My name is Alex, and I'll be narrating Hitman Online, a technical manual for independent contractors. Originally published 1983 by Paladin Press, written by Rex Ferrell. That's a pseudonym. I don't really know what the author's legal name is, government names and all. There is a warning. I do have to put it out there for all the smart retards out there. I do have to uh, let you all know that it is against the law to manufacture a silencer without an appropriate license from the federal government. There are state and local laws prohibiting the possession of weapons and their accessories in many areas. Severe penalties are prescribed for violations of these laws. Neither the author, nor the publisher, nor myself, Alex, the narrator, assumes any responsibility for the use or misuse of information contained in this book. It's for informational and educational purposes only. So don't hit me up with your fucking escapades and your accomplishments and achievements. I may or may not want to know, so if you are going to hit us up, have it be on a, on a professional level or something sincere. This is chapter six, Opportunity Knocks. Finding employment, what to charge, and who to avoid. And so it begins. Opportunity Knocks. You've read all the suggested reading material. You've honed your mind, body, and reflexes into a precise piece of of professional machinery. You've assembled the necessary tools and learned how to use them efficiently. Your knowledge of dealing death has increased to the point where you have a choice of methods. Finally, you are confident and competent enough to accept employment. Where do you start? Placing advertisements in military and gun magazines may get results, but not the type you are after. The only response one fellow I know got was a personal visit from the FBI, which certainly is not conducive to the preferred low profile. Even though he used a post office box, Big Brother was able to track him down with little effort. I do not recommend that you use this method of solicitation and that you respond or that you respond to these ads. Your best bet as a beginner is to uh what the fuck your best bet as a beginner is to of through a personal acquaintance is to what your best bet as a beginner let's just say is through a personal acquaintance these are typos from uh, either the author the original author or the publisher after editing or uploading uh, they're, they're just typos. Your best bet as a beginner is through a personal acquaintance whom you trust and who is capable of paying for your services. This person will be aware of your interest in weapons, your combat training, and your unconventional attitude. If he has a problem that needs solving, approach him gently to see how serious he is about getting it taken care of. You may start out as a bodyguard, courier, or messenger. Do whatever it takes to build your credibility. Based on his opinion of your trustworthiness and abilities, he may recommend to you someone who can take advantage of the services you offer, even though he may not have an immediate need. You will find that most of your jobs will come as a direct result of personal recommendations from previously satisfied customers. Use the reference material suggested in chapter one. And you can listen to chapter one in, I believe it's part one or part two of this audio book. You can find it uh, via the podcast. Your local newspaper will offer a host of potential employment opportunities, even a local gossip source. How many times have you heard about someone who has been burned and is eager for revenge? 
In most cases, it would be very unwise and unhealthy to use the direct approach on your first contract, especially if the prospective employer is someone you don't know on a personal basis. Neither are telephone contacts or written communications advisable. Obviously, because you're leaving a fucking trail. Be suspicious of anyone who approaches you directly about any illegal activity, unless, of course, that person has already established a bond of trust. And remember that moving too fast can scare away any potential employer with ready cash in his pocket. If you've heard or read of someone capable of paying for your services and with a definite need you can fill, but you don't personally know that person, there are a few ways to make yourself available inconspicuously. If possible, have a mutual acquaintance introduce you to him or her. The mutual acquaintance should be someone who has already established a bond of trust with the prospective employer so that his acceptance of you will be as good as personal as good as a personal recommendation. This comes back uh, just a, just a comment on this. This comes back to um establishing and building rapport, cultivating and developing social bonds. It, it and you might want to refer to uh what is it? part 4 or part 5 where I mention building rapport and uh establishing oneself but a a lot of it is going to come through infiltration, using urban camouflage, becoming aware of social aspects of an environment, not just the environmental setting, but the social setting of of an area, of a region, of a locality in order to infiltrate it effectively. You have to know uh, attitudes, mannerisms, behavior that won't have you stand out so much. If no mutual acquaintance is available, study the potential employer's habits and find a way to make yourself known to him. If he often visits the same bar, for for instance, if he often visits the same bar for is, what the fuck? If he often visits the same bar, for instance, you can make it a point to become a familiar face in the crowd. Whenever possible, make it a point to introduce yourself, gain his confidence, don't be pushy. And tactfully bring the subject of conversation around to his problems and needs. Using common sense and... What the fuck? Food? And good intuition. (laughs) Using common sense and good intuition, you will know when the time is right to offer your discreet services. And he will recognize your professionalism. Using common sense and... Uh, I keep wanting to pronounce food. Am I hungry? What the fuck? Using common sense and good intuition, you will know when the time is right to offer your discreet services and he will recognize your professionalism. The most important thing to keep in mind is the financial capability of the prospective employer. Your very first question in considering any employment opportunity is, can this man pay for my professional services? If you are in this line of work because of the power you feel when you make a kill or because you have a reckless, daring nature and get a thrill from flirting with death, keep these personal reasons to yourself. As far as the employer is concerned, you are only in it for the money. When the subject is finally broached and the conversation gets down to the nitty gritty, listen to the man as he talks. Check him out to see if you really want to become involved in his personal affairs. Uh, just a quick commentary. This is the 21st century. And although this manual, this technical manual for independent contractors was originally published in 1983, so it's damn near almost 40 years old, keep in mind that the employer could be male or female or somewhere in between. And they could easily, just as easily go from employee, I'm sorry, from employer to um to just a former employer, to just formally, <laughs> just to just former, formally known as. <laughs> is he full of hot air, just a big talker, or is her serious? Is he is he serious? You see fucking typos. Is he full of hot air, just a big talker, or is he serious about eliminating his problem? 
Does he have the personal courage to carry out or have you carry out the solution he is after? Will he be overburdened by guilt or remorse afterwards? Is he cautious in his conversation? Is he appraising you just as hard as you are appraising him? Maybe evaluating. I think that, that'd be a, evaluating or assessing. Appraising? I don't know if that's the right word. But how tough is he? Will he break under pressure and point a finger at you? Does he brag or tell stories out of school, quote unquote? Quote unquote, out of school? Maybe that's a that's an old, sounds like an old uh, term about uh, just being out of pocket, just having loose lips. If he tells you about other hits he's fronted or starts to name names, he talks too much. Forget him. Does he come right down and ask you to make a hit for him before he has determined your qualifications? If so, he may be asking people all over town. You don't need that type of conversation following a prospective mark around. During that initial conversation, you both should be mentally asking these questions of each other, but no actual conversation about a contract or the identity of the mark should be discussed unless unusual circumstances make it proper. Let us let a short period of time go by, if possible, before your second meeting. Use this time to analyze your potential employer and decide whether you are willing to risk offering your services. Follow your gut feelings. If the man acts earnest and sincere, if he meets all the questions you have posed in your mind while you talked, if he seems on the up and up and yet you still have a gut feeling that something is just not right, follow your intuition and back off. The employer should have a healthy respect for your ability and be aware of the consequences should he decide to cross you. At the same time, a man with that kind of money to spend can pay someone to waste you. If he's too condescending, your intuition should tell you to pass. At the second meeting, gently maneuver the conversation to the real purpose for your visit. You may want to initially operate under the guise of knowing someone else who may be willing to fulfill his needs. If he tactfully asks if your services are available, you can just as tactfully request information about what he needs done, what he wants done. You should be willing and able to provide him with all the information you need to do a clean and efficient job, and a price should be agreed on. Prices vary according to risk involved, social or political prominence of the victim, difficulty of the assignment, and other factors. A federal judge recently brought a price of $250,000, for example. A county sheriff might bring $75,000 to $100,000. In some cases, your employer, might expect, your employer may expect to receive hefty benefits from double indemnity life insurance clauses. If so, you should be notified in advance that this is an insurance job. Is the intended victim close enough to the employer that his being the beneficiary will arouse any suspicion? Is the policy an old one or one he recently purchased and wants to collect on? Is the amount to be collected way out of proportion to the victim's lifestyle and means? Consider these questions before you accept the job and get your money up front. Otherwise, you may be standing in the bread lines while you wait for the money to come through, or your employer may have long since become a prime suspect in someone's investigation. Depending on the benefits of the insurance policy, it is not uncommon to collect one-fourth to one-half of the expected monies for your services. The risk is on all your shoulders until the job is complete. Is all on your shoulders. The risk is all, yeah, not, not all your shoulders. The risk is all on your shoulders until the job is complete. Your shoulders being the, the contractor's shoulders, I'm assuming. The risk is all on your, is all on your, yeah, the risk is all on your shoulders until the job is complete. Your contract amount should be at least enough to hire the services of a good attorney if anything should go wrong. It is not recommended that you take any contract that pays less than $30,000 and that is working mighty cheap. To work for any amount less would be amateurish. 
There are guys all over town who will kill a man for $50 to $5,000. And the people who hire these thugs usually get exactly what they pay for. Just a side commentary. Uh, that's true. There are people willing to kill for $50 to $5,000. And circumstances, it's all dependent on circumstances. It's all contextually dependent on uh, on the facts and the situation. $50, uh, while it sounds cheap, might just be some kind of nominal or, or symbolic fee. Uh, I mean, I've I've seen things happen for a handshake, and you know, for a fucking favor, and uh, for an exchange of favors. But um, there are two good reasons to <laughs> there are two good reasons for setting a thirty thousand dollar minimum for your services. And 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 I totally get it. if you're working as an independent contractor, you may or may not stick around in somebody's life long enough to do a job for a handshake. So setting a minimum price, if you're going to be on the move, if you're, if you're going to be doing it moving, if you're going to be living life on the move, then yeah, you want to set a minimum so, you, uh, so, so you're in the wind, always. First, the risks involved are high. You could become injured or lose your life while attempting to carry out your assignment. But worse yet, you might make some mistakes that will cost your freedom or bring capital punishment as the penalty. A fee of $5,000 or even $10,000 will be of little consolation as you wait helplessly behind bars. Second, because the risks are so high and employment opportunities are limited, the money you should... The money you earn should be sufficient to carry you over until your next job comes along. Unless you live in a very large city like New York or Chicago, you will want to limit the number of jobs you do in your own hometown. Most hitmen like to limit contracts to one or two a year for obvious reasons. It is a good idea to have your employer promise to cover any legal expenses as part of your agreement. This can be done through a discreet arrangement with his attorney, should those legal services become necessary. This acts as a sort of insurance for both of you. You should receive expense money up front on all jobs. This money is separate and not included in the contract amount. Expenses generally run between $500 and $5,000 depending on the type of job and the job location. The money will cover travel, lodging, food, accessories such as disguises and equipment since all of these things are disposable and will enable you to replace any throwaway weapon you use on that particular job. Any amount left over belongs to you. Do not cut any corners trying to make an extra buck. Give the man the most professional job his money can buy. Generally, the method used to make the hit is at the contractor's discretion. If the employer requests that a certain method be used, making the job more difficult and dangerous by your by your being obligated to follow his explicit instructions, you are entitled to ask for a higher fee. That makes sense. That makes sense. Let me read that one more time. If the employer requests that a certain method be used, making the job more difficult and dangerous by your being obligated to follow his explicit instructions, you are entitled to ask for a higher fee. Quote unquote, accidental death and quote unquote, suicides are included in those special requests, as are disposing of a body, arson, and so on. In most cases, it is common to receive half of the contract amount and all expense money up front and half upon satisfactory completion. Of course, these monies are to be paid in cash. Up front, hold up. Up, um, of course, these monies are to be paid in cash. Why is there a slash here? What the fuck? Maybe, well, I, I mean, cash is cash is king, right? But I mean, you could do a little bit of trading. Cash slash what? Travelers checks, uh, cashier cashiers checks, motherfucking gold, some other valuables. At the at the third meeting. Whatever. At the third meeting, the employer should provide you with an envelope containing the assembled information required. 
at, at the third meeting, the employer should provide you with an envelope containing the assembled information requested, expense monies, and the contract amount according to your agreement. Your acceptance of this material and monies from your employer represents your acceptance of his offer for employment and his acceptance of your ability to do the required job in an efficient and timely manner. Pause. Pause right there. Yeah, that uh, that makes total sense. I mean, yeah, legally speaking, in creating a contract, uh, your receipt your receipt of what you've requested in return for services offered, if you hold your hand out and you receive what it is that's been considered a form of payment, that is considerably a form of payment, you've accepted the offer. You you are now, you now have a foot in the door. You, you, you're now committed. You're now tied to your employer. You have now become an independent contractor. The employer in most cases should not know exactly when the actual hit will take place. He may, however, give you a deadline based on his personal needs. Of course, you should inform him that the deed will be performed within 30 days or whatever time frame you have established based on the information provided. In addition to his not knowing exactly when the hit will take place, He should not know how it will take place unless the method to be used is a specific part of your agreement. Afterwards, he is not entitled to any details of how the actual job went down. It is better for both of you if the only information available to your employer is the same information made available to the general public. Which is nothing. Um, Right. I mean, which is nothing. You don't... (laughs) Why would it be available to the general public? All right. If the employer is a close friend of a business associate, your relationship should continue in the usual fashion. Uh, Hold up. If the employer is a close friend or, yeah, or business associate. I get that. Okay. It's a typo. Sorry. If the employer is a close friend or business associate, your relationship should continue in the usual fashion without interruption. It is best for both of you to continue with your usual life patterns. If you normally visit one another's homes, continue to do so. If you meet for lunch or play golf on occasion, continue to do so. If you usually frequent the same bar and share a few drinks, Don't start treating one another as strangers now. Keep things the same as they were before you made your death-dealing partnership. Don't arouse suspicion or start gossip. If the employer is someone you hardly know and this is purely a business venture, work out some code of conduct when the job is complete so the employer will know you are ready for payoff on the remainder of your contract money some code some code or of contact contact i guess yeah some code of contact if the employer is someone you hardly know and this is purely a business venture work out some code of contact some code or some code some mode probably some mode of contact when the job is complete so the employer will know you are ready for payoff on the remainder of your contract money The code can be as simple as a telephone call. Hello, is Margaret Smith there? I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. Once you have completed your part of the agreement, the majority of the risk and responsibility is transferred to the employer, and he has as much to lose as you do. Just remember, a satisfied customer may be your best source for future employment opportunities. And that concludes... Chapter 6. Thank you for considering the Corporate Cowboys podcast. To keep this operation non for profit, please visit the Instagram page. That's the Corporate Cowboys. I'm sure you'll recognize it. You could also follow on Patreon. That's the Corporate Cowboys podcast and subscribe. And you're, I mean, you're a smart, reasonable person. If you find links to shoot a donation, by all means, do so. That goes towards expenses and legal fees. Until next time.